Okay, hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is the fourth um, in this series of interviews that we've been trying to do with health professionals during the coronavirus pandemic that's got everyone locked down. Today, I'm really happy to be joined by Dr. Alice Nicholl, who is a practicing NHS dentist <laughs> uh, down in the Cornwall area. Hello, Alice. Hello. <laughs> so me and Alice were very briefly at university together. Um, when I was doing my first degree and Alice was doing her proper um, meaningful degree. She's now <laughs> made it. Um, how, how many years have you been graduated now, Alice? Uh, coming up three now. Three, okay. So properly mm-hmm. into the NHS workforce. Yeah. Um, so today we're just going to be talking about the kind of, I guess, the role and practice of a dentist, how dentistry Mm -hmm. and medicine overlap, how that all fits into the healthcare service, um, the state of NHS dentistry, I guess, and then we'll move on to kind of the coronavirus situation, how that's how that's affecting everyone. So um, you just give us a bit of a a summary of yourself, Alice. Um, So, yeah, basically, I am 26. I've been graduated for coming up three years now. I went straight into just standard NHS dentistry after university. So, you know, you've got the option of doing one of the hospital jobs, SHO, Max Fax, that kind of thing. I decided that I kind of had enough of university and I was just ready to get to work. So I just went straight into kind of NHS dentistry, do a little bit of private work here and there, but for the most part, definitely just National Health Service. Have started doing a little bit of facial aesthetics as well on the side, so that's kind of like my special interest. But yeah, for the most part, just box standard dentistry. <laughs> for, for those of us at, at home, what what do you mean when you say facial aesthetics? Um, so that's your Botox, fillers, chemical peels, microneedling, all that kind of. I know so stuff. little about the cosmetics industry. <laughs> What on earth is a facial peel? Um, so basically it's when you put quite a strong acid on the top surface of your skin that causes it to peel off and then nice fresh new skin comes through underneath. So good for kind of scarring, pigmentation, that kind of thing, just kind of new skin, fresh. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds awful. <laughs> it is pretty bad, but it's worth it in the end. <laughs> yeah, people clearly want it. Obviously, you, you mentioned the option of, of going into things like max fax and doing the hospital job. So there's, a, I take it, then a difference between maybe hospital dentistry and community or? or yeah, know, so there's a few different pathways you can go down. So after you do the five years of dentistry, we basically do an F1 year the same way you do, which is just more kind of generalized stuff. From that, you can decide then just to go in and become a general practitioner. So, you know, the dental equivalent of a GP, which is what I am. Alternatively, you can do dental core training. And there's various different paths you go down with that. So you can do the community dentistry, which covers, you know, sedation, treating people with special needs, vulnerable people, things like that. Or you can get into the hospital route, SHO jobs, where again, that would be things like sedation, Max Fax. I know a few people end up working on A and E and stuff as well. Um, so it kind of depends what your interest is and what path you want to go down. Okay, then. I mean, th- this has always been a, a, a kind of pressing question um, that I would myself quite like <laughs> an answer from someone who knows. Dentistry is a five-year course. Yeah. Um, obviously, um, medicine normally five or six-year course. Obviously, you're doing the anatomy and physiology of basically the entire body. Um, yeah. Dentistry, as far as I'm aware, is just concerned with head and neck. <laughs> no, okay, so basically, but... um, this is what everybody thinks. Like, the first question is always, you only learn about the teeth. You know, why does it take <laughs> six years in total? Actually, the first three, three and a half years of dentistry, very similar to medicine. So we also cover basically full body anatomy other than the legs and kind of gynecology and that area. Everything else we need to know about because a lot of medical conditions will flare up in the mouth first. So you kind of need to recognize what's going on as well. A lot of times people see their dentist between two, maybe more four, five, six times a year. So we can keep a closer eye on their general appearance. You know, we were taught all about 
how to recognize finger clubbing because we're more likely to pick that up before you know someone goes to their gp about it yeah, so sure. first three years actually quite a lot of medicine in that as well we do the same work with cadavers that you guys would do it's then fourth and fifth year we diverge a bit into more head and neck teeth focus more on like max fax kind of stuff but yeah. definitely the first three years you do get a bit of a general look at everything as well. Who knew? It, genuine, like, it's something that I've never really <laughs> had an answer to. But I guess, I suppose you must do a lot of the pharmacology as well, given oh, yeah. anaesthetics. and. Yeah, a lot of yeah anaesthetics. We obviously need to know full details about medicines, medical history, because we prescribe a lot. We use a lot of different chemicals. So you need to understand the interactions as well. Cancer treatments can have a big impact on how you treat patients. Sure. So you do need to have a good overview of lots of different things rather than just kind of this little bit here. <laughs> um, okay, fantastic. Well, I, I guess it might just be worth talking about MaxFax very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. We, we kind of say, you know, shorthand MaxFax. And obviously um, medics can become MaxFax practitioners as well for, for the boys and girls at home. Um what are we talking about when we're talking about max facts? So maxillofacial, it's basically kind of do this region here, a bit of the neck as well. Whenever we were doing the max facts wards, we would observe a lot of surgery, kind of cancer, kind of nodes being removed, reconstructions, saw a few degloving injuries, you know, kind of those things being stitched back up again. So yeah, maxillofacial. It's kind of a combination of dentistry and medicine together, dealing more with the head and neck and everything in there. Yeah, for, for, so for, for those at home, um, I think it's, I think I'm correct in saying that MaxFax has the longest training pathway. Of... Yeah, you have to do medicine and dentistry. Yeah, I, I can't think of anything that would have, because in order to become a MaxFax practitioner, um, for those at home, you, you, as Alice said, you have to be both a qualified medic and a qualified dentist. I think you also have to be licensed to practice independently as both. So you'd have to mm. do the F1, the F2 and the dentistry foundation job. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you would have to do surgical training to consultant level. Um, so it's a, a long old... A long old investment. It is. <laughs> Do many, w when you were studying um, the course at Newcastle, was that the goal of many people or? A few. So I know a few people now actually who were in my year, they're now studying medicine. They've got on doing medicine as well. I know a few people kind of went in, like myself, I went in interested in Max Fax, And then by the time I was done with five years of dentistry, I think I'm nothing worse than having to go back in, study medicine, do all the extra years. So yeah. I think some people, obviously, it is their goal. They know definitely that's what they want to do. Other people will have a kind of interest in it, but not enough to pursue that as their main career. Yeah. So they would go more for the um, dental core training, hospital jobs after they graduate, where you do get a little bit of max fax experience without having to kind of do the whole slog. Sure. So... So you're you're in the more um, I guess through through my fairly glib view of the situation you're more, more akin to to what would be a GP in yeah. medicine or a general dentist. So what yeah. what's a typical day for for you if you go in any day of the week? Yeah, basically a little bit of so you'll have checkups which are kind of ten minutes. You'll do on top of that kind of fillings, dentures, crowns, bridges, the dreaded root canal. A little bit of aesthetic treatment as well so kind of whitening composite bonding veneers that kind of thing so basically kind of anything you can do in dentistry we would dabble in a little bit of all of it cool so um here's a question i, I think this is one many people have and it's actually been on there multiple times why can't i find an nhs dentist in my area so this is a controversial question so basically about 10 years ago, the way dentistry worked was 
you got paid for what you did. And then, yeah, about 10 years ago, the contracts were changed the way that NHS dentists were paid in England uh, and Wales. So the way it works now, we've got a banding system. So there's band one, band two, band three, which are all different prices. So band one is about 20 pounds, band two, 60 pounds, and then band three is about 250, and those are the patient charges. Mm -hmm. Because it's in a band now, the patient only pays once. So if you've got a patient who needs one filling, you'll get paid the set kind of, they'll pay the set 60 pounds charge. If they need 20 fillings, 10 root canals, they still only pay 60 pounds. Right. Out of that, that's not the money that the dentist gets paid either. We get a very small portion of that. So we would get about 30 pounds out of that. So a lot of dentists obviously weren't happy at this, that now you could be spending hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours yeah. and hours and you take home 30 pounds, which for people of higher need who need a lot of work done, that often works out far below minimum wage what you're earning. So yeah. costs were staying the same. It was costing you know, materials, staff, building rent, still the same cost, but now your income had kind of plummeted down. Yeah. So a lot of dentists then decided, you know what, this doesn't work for me. So they decided to go private. So a few dentists obviously stayed NHS, um, but a lot of them left the NHS, which means there's now, um, oh. I think on our waiting list, we've got about 30,000 people waiting. That's, I, I, I mean, so I, I've never good. had that. Yeah, I've never had that insight before, and that's that's actively, and and this was a this was an NHS decision that this was how. Yeah, the government at the time um, decided this. So obviously, it's better for the patients because they pay just one time yeah. for multiple items, but for the dentists who are doing the same amount of work. Yeah. Big big pay cut. <laughs> yeah, who are very very highly trained professionals yeah. um i mean there, there's a there's a question because ob obviously it, you can understand why everyone left it's a, it's amazing that there's anyone still in the yeah. nhs yeah like that that's a terrible you know if you do 20 fillings and taking home however much but so th that raises a question then um in in your opinion just uh, as you sit here as an nhs dentist do you think that we would benefit from a situation where, as with medical patients, you, you know, patients don't pay anything. Dental care is covered in the same way. Yeah. It almost amazes me that it's not like that. I think um, a lot of people don't realise how expensive dentistry is. So kind of the filling materials that we use, white filling materials, they cost hundreds of pounds for a box of those. The cements that we use to stick, you know, a loose crown or veneer back on about 150 pounds for a tube of fluoride varnish that we paint on children's teeth that's about 20 quid per tiny tube so i think the government are looking at it where dentistry costs an awful lot of money and they can't really afford to subsidize it completely as well i think they look at it that a lot of dental problems are avoidable you know through good brushing yeah good diet so they they're trying to put it back on the patients to look after mm. their own teeth and I think they're hoping that if you have to pay for dental treatments, people will look after the teeth a bit better. But it's obviously not always the case. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're still doing incredibly expensive, like coronary artery bypass grafts and, yeah. and things, aren't we? It's stenting and yeah, all of that. I think <laughs> a lot of dentists in the NHS uh, get a bit annoyed because we're basically collecting tax almost because the patient will pay, say, uh, £60 for a filling. We yeah. get paid usually less than half of that. The patient thinks that the dentist is getting all of that money, but the remainder yeah. of what they're paying is obviously going straight back to the government again. And every year the government put up the prices for NHS dentistry, so they were due to go up again this week. But due to coronavirus, I think they put it on hold for a little while. That's, but yeah, NHS shocking. dentists are kind of yeah, used as <laughs> tax men. And then we get shouted at by the public because they I, think I was gonna we're say, driving yeah. Ferraris and earning a fortune when, in fact, most of what you pay goes straight up to the government again, oh. never reaches my pocket. <laughs> God, yeah, no, I, I never knew that. That's that's I, I feel like, well, yeah, many, many people, as you say, probably don't know that. No, well, let this be a lesson to everyone at home. Um, <laughs> 
but I'll, I'll go into the next. But based on what you just said, um, mm -hmm. we all clearly need to look after our teeth better. Yeah. Um, just as an optimal routine, what should we all be doing? So I know kind of traditionally people kind of brush their teeth and then mouthwash and that's kind of them doing. What I tell my patients is ideally I would start with flossing or using the little TP brushes you can get in between your teeth. Do that first. Don't have to do it twice a day. If you do it kind of every day before bed, it means your teeth are nice and clean before bed. So I would do a bit of flossing first. That kind of loosens everything up, gets rid of all the little bits that are stuck. Then I would use the mouthwash to get rid of all those little bits and pieces that you've loosened up. And then I would brush your teeth at the end for the full two minutes. I would try and avoid using mouthwash directly after brushing, just because the toothpaste has a lot more fluoride in it. Mouthwash doesn't. So if you mouthwash straight after brushing, all of the good ingredients from the toothpaste are going down the sink hole instead of, you know, actually working on your teeth. So I would sure. floss, mouthwash, brush, job done. <laughs> I, th I think it's somewhat counterintuitive. I bet not that many people do what you've just described. Yeah, because I think some patients uh, think we're trying to catch them out because, you know, I know one of my colleagues always says, OK, do you rinse after brushing? And the patient will try and be smart and say, yeah, 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 always rinse after brushing. And he's like, aha, <laughs> no, <Yeah, don't>. bad. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Got <Gotcha. laughs> God. Um, is, is it fair... Um, again this is a, a strange assumption maybe is it fair does most of the decay that you're you as a dentist are worried about does that happen overnight no so to be, get a proper hole in your tooth it does take a good bit of time so obviously it's all dependent on if you're using fluoride toothpaste how much sugar you're eating how often you're having it if you're constantly swigging down the coke non-stop all day you will develop a cavity a lot faster than someone who doesn't. Usually it will take kind of days, weeks to develop a proper hole. It works its way into the dentine and that's when you start having sensitivity, toothache, that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. Oh, fair enough. Uh, 20 minutes in. Now let's head into um, global affairs. So you obviously in a, in a typical day, as you were saying, you're stood right next to people's mouths all day potentially um i assume everything you do virtually is an aerosol generating procedure yeah so <laughs> how is the current climate affecting dentists um a bit of a nightmare at the minute so basically we go back when did lockdown start about a week and a half ago so about two weeks ago we were obviously boris came out and said you know not in a lockdown yet social distancing two meters apart stop any non-essential trips or anything yeah at that point we hadn't had any instruction from nhs england about what we should be doing so at that point i know a lot of dentists independently were making the decision to scale back their diaries so that's what i was doing anybody having cleans done cancelled them anybody having non-essential fillings or aesthetic work done i asked reception to cancel them as well because it was all a bit up in the air. I didn't feel like it was definitely safe. Got to the end of the week, kind of two weeks ago before the lockdown, and we were told to stop any aerosol generating procedures. So we don't have, you know, the proper PPE. We just have surgical masks, which yeah. are, as you know, completely ineffective. The issue with dentistry is pretty much everything is an aerosol generating procedure. Any cleaning, any work with the drill, even taking x-rays inside the mouth, obviously quite a few people will gag and cough, mm, which is, yeah. you know, like lovely aerosol. So basically we were limited to doing emergencies only, uh, basically extractions because we couldn't do any root canals um, and basic exams if needed. So that was that kind of two weeks ago. End of last week, finally got some word from the chief dental officer in England to kind of stop all dentistry altogether. So what they're basically planning at the minute is setting up urgent dental care centres. I believe there's going to be a few in each county. They will have the proper PPE, so any emergencies will be sent to those designated centres. Individual practices at the minute, because we can't do anything because we don't have the PPE, we're just doing kind of telephone triaging at the minute, yeah. but we can't see anybody face to face. 
okay yeah as you say a lot of um if not most gps um just again for those interested in the country have gone to to telemedicine um as the the one thing i find quite entertaining was the fact that the gps in my local area had all stopped face to face contact and weren't seeing anybody anymore but the dentists were being told to keep working as normal oh my god um i mean i saw I, th- I think it was on the news this morning or in one of the the papers it was a an announcement from one of the the high ups saying that dentists had all i think this morning or yesterday received like everyone's received ppe um yeah but then i i asked some some closer dentist colleagues and they were saying like well where is it then i think it's the same you know hospital staff at the minute are being told that they've got the ppe when they know that they don't have the ppe and yeah he's been on the news two nights in a row now i think saying that all dentists have received ppe I would assume that he means these urgent dental care centres have received the PPE, but as of here or now, there still aren't any centres set up in Cornwall because they don't have the PPE. So, unsure where he means or where it's gone to, but I would say definitely not every dentist has received the PPE. And okay, well then let's talk about the uh, the sort of the reason i've thought of this is i i can hear on my my street outside is we've got a clap going on right now um yeah someone <laughs> very inconsiderately setting off fireworks in the background I can hear them. um i think many people feel and you may feel the same way that dentists have been somewhat tragically overlooked in this all um this whole situation everyone's very cognizant of doctors and nurses and and so on and so forth um why is it that the dentists have been forgotten i feel like we always are like even aside from coronavirus dentistry is always that forgotten branch of healthcare. i don't know whether it's because kind of the nhs numbers have dropped so a lot of people have gone private that were forgotten about whether it's the fact that patients do pay for it and it's not kind of you know free we're forgotten about I don't know whether it's because generally the public hate us and hates coming to see us. So we're, they like to just pretend we don't exist. Um, but it's always been that way. Dentistry is always kind of forgotten about. With dentistry as well in the NHS, we're self-employed contractors for the NHS. We don't mm. count as employees. So I don't know whether that's a part of it as well, that we're not technically employees of the NHS, even though I still work for the NHS, that we're just always a second thought but it can be very frustrating sometimes because I'm there at work you know still going and the world is all closing down around me doctors closed and everything and I'm still there with my little drill like oh everything's fine <laughs> let's uh, on the comparison between medicine and dentistry then th- this is more for the benefit of of people who are thinking about applying for medicine and dentistry there's a mm. lot of overlap obviously in the core qualities and things yeah. like that and I've ended up myself, I think I spoke to you at the time, doing quite a few mock dentistry interviews. Yeah. Um, I was very rapidly Googling what amalgam is <laughs> during, <laughs> during <laughs> these things. Um, how how would someone know at, say, the level of maybe they're doing their A-levels or, the, or they're, they're, they've done a first degree and they're trying to decide what to do with their lives? Um mm-hmm. How would someone know from the offset as to whether a career in medicine or dentistry, how would they know which one might be better for them? I think it comes down to kind of personal preference and where you see yourself going. So for me in school, you know, I had all the A grades, did all the sciences and it was the same for me. I was choosing between medicine or dentistry. Yeah. I kind of looked at my overall life and thought, you know where do I want to go what do I want to be doing I went for dentistry in the end because medicine to kind of specialize it's a lot longer pathway and I was thinking to myself do I really want to be in like potentially my late 30s and still be working my way up the ladder (laughs) (laughs) but as well for me things like working hours to dentistry generally nine to five weekdays 
you know, because you are classed as self-employed, you do have a lot more freedom with time off, holidays, kind of maternity, setting your own working hours, that kind of thing. So yeah. for me, dentistry, you still got to be involved in healthcare, still, you know, helps people, helps get people out of pain, but you still had a little bit more freedom with your lifestyle instead of like the on-call, the weekends, working your way up the ladder, all that kind of thing. So I think it just comes down to what kind of person you are and where you see yourself going. What, what I think you just said is ultimately extremely sensible um, and it's I think the most pragmatic answer that makes sense to most people to that that question I, I absolutely yeah. agree with you um based on everything I know about both medicine and dentistry mm. the problem that I can see is that I feel like that justification wouldn't work very well in an interview for example for dentistry potentially um what what should although I think it's completely sensible I feel like it's not a golden tick box answer so if we put our sort of sycophantic, idealistic hats on, what should someone say if they're asked in their dentistry interview, for example, why not medicine? Yeah. Well, I had talked about, you know, basically being interested in dentistry a bit when I was younger as well. Dentistry, you know, you get to get people out of pain. There's also the impact of a smile, having a nice smile on someone, you know, being able to see, because it's happened with me myself with patients that, you know, I've gone years with barely any teeth or anything. We've made them a nice denture. And honestly, the change like that and their confidence is unbelievable. So I think yeah. dentistry, you know, you can give people their confidence back, which on the surface might seem like a superficial thing, you know, someone's appearance, whatever. But when it's affecting what they do, they're not leaving their house, they're not smiling, they're not socializing. Not only are you kind of treating the health side of things and you know getting people out of pain, you can also potentially give someone their life back again. Yeah. So I think you know, I think if everybody kind of went down the medical route, you know, that's great. But we're always gonna need dentists and we are gonna need people to give people their confidence back and to help with toothache and you know, that kind of thing. That's really good. No, that, that that's exactly what, what I meant. Like that's a, um, you know, that that's a really nice, um, unintuitive answer, but a really, really nice one. Um, is, is that my, my next question was going to be what, you know, what's your favorite thing about being a dentist? But it, is that the answer? Yeah, I think I like the fact that you do see a lot of people in the day, you know, I've got some patients I'm quite excited when they come in because, you know, great banter, have a laugh, you get to talk to people, kind of talk to people briefly all day. The rest of the time you're obviously in their mouths. But yeah, yeah being able to get people out of pain and seeing the relief of people when they're not having toothache anymore. You know, people often describe toothache as one of the worst pains you can have. You know, they'd rather go through childbirth again mm. than have toothache. So seeing people have that relief, getting them out of pain. And as well, yeah, making crowns are doing nice fillings and dentures and giving people their confidence back again you know quite often you'll see ladies who come in they've struggled for ages with their confidence and their smile they'll come in won't be wearing any makeup just generally won't smile be covering their mouths you'll do a nice bit of dental work for them next time they're in they'll have their hair done they'll have lipstick on they'll be smiling and it's just seeing that complete flip in a person and how you can just change their life and change their confidence from Amazing. a little bit of dental work. It's very rewarding. It makes you feel <laughs> inside. <laughs> it's, 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 it's funny that the um, the first of these interviews that I did was with a, a data scientist and he was, well, he's, he's a junior doctor turned data scientist and he was talking about actually spending small amounts of time or doing small things can actually have a huge impact on, on someone's health and so it's something that I've, in doing these interviews, I've been hearing that sort of notion a lot from from health professionals, which is really yeah. nice. Um, the last couple of questions that I had then, you mentioned that it's a, a mostly private um, setting, I guess, in, in dentistry. Is it, as is the case with a lot of GP practices, do you, are you contracted within the practice or is, do you, is the plan to become a partner or how, how does that side of it work? So basically kind of 
NHS wise, the way I work it, the NHS contracts work out to practices. And then so the practice will have a contract to do a certain amount of dental work in a year. And then we are the subcontractors. So each associate we're called, we're all associates in the practice, will be given, you know, a set bit of the contract work wise to do. Privately, you don't really have a contract or anything. You just kind of see who you want to see, charge who you want to charge. But yeah, within the NHS, it's all kind of subcontracted down. So kind of career wise, a lot of people are just associates. So you will work with several other dentists in the practice. You may have a principal dentist, that'll be the dentist who kind of owns the practice, they're the head dentist. Some practices like mine, we don't have a principal dentist, it's just associates and then kind of a practice manager. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's basically the setup. Fair enough. And then lastly, the, the thing I wanted to talk about was the the aesthetics and the specialty stuff. The impression I had of all that, the sort of thing, it's like the Harley Street dentist, you know, go and get your crowns or your so on and so forth, your, your Botox and your lip fillers and, and all that. I guess what I'm asking is if someone finishes their dental degree and they, they do their foundation job, how how easy is it to make that transition if, if that's what you decide you want to do? Pretty easy. In dentistry, you've got the option of becoming, you know, a proper specialist and that's through doing kind of like a master's in something and going down that route. There are a lot of courses you can do in dentistry that while you can't call yourself a specialist, you will receive more training in it. So I've decided to go down kind of the facial aesthetics route. So yeah, the Botox and the fillers. For that, I've just done multiple different courses, different people, learnt different things over time. You pay, you know, as you go on the course, that's it. The same can go if you're interested in say doing really beautiful white fillings, you can sign up to do courses in that. So dentistry, you can still specialize a little bit without becoming an actual consultant specialist. It's just a matter of finding a course that you like, doing the course, paying for it, and then you'll take something away from that and you can then use it in practice. And are you allowed to then, um, you, you said you couldn't call yourself a specialist, but even maybe without that registered specialist label, are you still able to advertise you know, I can do particularly good fillings or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And like you can get obviously patient consent for before and after photographs. So you can use that as your advertisement and show what you can do. I so see. yeah, you can't call yourself a specialist, but you can definitely say, I've done this course, I've trained with this famous person, you know, I've sure. done this, look what I can do. So there are ways to get around that. In dentistry, definitely it's not the end of the road if you decide not to do further training in the hospital you can still dabble in various little bits and pieces amazing as a last remark then if you will what um what one bit of advice or what one lesson have you got from your career so far that you would give to young would-be dentists out there don't think you're going to be driving a ferrari uh <laughs> <laughs> and you know as i kind of said sorry it's not just about the teeth there is a lot more work and a lot of learning to be done and it can at times be a pretty stressful job, despite the fact, you know, you're just working in the one little room every day. So I'd say don't go into dentistry thinking that it's like an easier medicine or it's a quick way to earn money or anything like that, because it's not. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. I did. Right. I'm going to have one cheeky last question. Yeah. You're a dentist. Who looks after your teeth? I haven't had my teeth looked at, I don't think, since I was at university. But, but I've never had a feeling, you know, I've never had anything like that. I think it's the fact that I know I can access dental care at any time. Like I can say to any of my colleagues, you know, this tooth is a bit sensitive. Can you take an x-ray? So I just kind of don't get it looked at. But um, as well because I am a dentist, like I know how to look after my teeth, you know, good yeah, diet, yeah. good brushing. So I think I'm a bit less likely to have a problem anyway. But it is a problem among dentists that we don't have regular six monthly checkups. Yeah. It's kind of, we are our own dentists. <laughs> okay, on that note, um, that's where we wrap things up. So thank you very much for coming and speaking to me. To yeah, no problem. Um, uh, how can people, because um, I know you've got your own social media presences, how can people keep up with all the exciting things you're doing? Um, basically just Instagram at the minute. So it's Dr. Nickel, N-I-C-H-O-L-L. -L. That's kind of it for now. May branch into kind of YouTube, Facebook in the future. 
but for now it's Do just it. kind of me ranting on instagram so you can find me there <laughs> amazing we'll make sure that there's a, a link to that in the video description um mm -hmm. that goes along with this i i follow the page myself just out of morbid interest about people's teeth um, <laughs> so it is really worth a follow do go and check that out people thanks for coming on alice we will speak yeah, to no you problem. soon take care bye <laughs> thanks for watching guys there are three ways you can support the channel the first one is to like comment subscribe share this video with a friend just enjoy it generally Second, you can buy me a coffee if you found it useful using my Ko-Fi link, which will help keep me awake during the editing process. And then thirdly, you can use my referral link to save 10% off your first year of Complete Anatomy 2020, my favourite 3D anatomy learning tool. Take care guys and I'll see you next time.